Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Man, Pastor Wally is optimistic, isn't he? He's calling it springtime. I like it. Yeah. It may not be spring yet, but it's spring in our hearts. And the snow's dying, which is wonderful to see. Good morning, everyone. I am Mike Verlin. I'm the lead pastor here at Grace Bible Fellowship. If you don't know me, hi. It's nice to meet you. Uh, if you've never met me before, come see me after service. Or if you've forgotten who I am, come see me after service. That's great. That's fine. Right? We all forget things. So here we are this morning. I'm excited about the message this morning. I'm, but I'm really excited about our prayer challenge. Right? We are on day four of our one month long prayer challenge. And I know that a lot of people have uh, been uh, signing up, uh, getting on our Facebook page, looking at our prayer challenge page, uh, putting some things down there, uh, getting into prayer maybe for the first time, maybe getting back into prayer. It's been awesome uh, to see. It's great. I get uh, updates um, from the site, from Facebook, for people who are liking the page, people who are going on the page. and. We're starting to see people that are not from around here, people from all over the place, uh, getting in on the prayer challenge. And I love it. I have coworkers at the Y who come up to me and said, hey, I just want you to know I'm doing the prayer challenge. It's like, awesome. Praise God for that. I had someone come up to me in the grocery store and say, hey, I just want you to know I'm doing the prayer challenge. And I was like, yeah, I don't know who you are, but I'm glad that you are doing the prayer challenge. No, I love it. Right? It's, it's what, I love it because I don't want it to be just about our church. I want it to be about every church. I want it to be about people getting into a, a relationship with Christ, praying, talking to God, getting to know Him, seeing what God wants in their life. And I just love seeing it, and I know that there are prayers that are already being answered. Uh, so just keep going. Keep going. If you haven't started yet, today's a good day to start. All right? Today's a good day to start. One day four. I'm asking if you haven't done it before to, uh, it's really simple. Whatever day of the month it is, pray that many minutes. Today is March 4th. Pray for four minutes. You know what's interesting is I had, some, I had multiple people say to me on day one, do you have any idea how hard it is to only pray for a minute? <laughs> yes, I do. And that's one of the things I love about it is because you're going to find that and you're going to find that as you go and as you build and as you really get to know God and start spending time uh, worshiping Him through prayer, that you're going to find that on day 30, you're going to say to me, you have any idea how hard it is to only pray for 30 minutes? How hard it is to only pray for 31 minutes in a day? We should be people of prayer, people who are communicating with God. So keep going with the prayer challenge. Uh, keep praying. Uh, amazing things are going to happen. The last two weeks, we've had some pretty awesome uh, focused messages on loving God first, right? Putting Him first in our life and prayer. And this morning, I'm excited about uh, the message that God has given uh, for me this morning. And this is just draft one. Last week, it was the third draft of the third message that God gave me for the week. Today, it is message one of one that God has given. So I'm excited about it. I want to ask you a question, and I don't want you to respond, but I want you to answer this to yourself. What are you looking for? And what are you looking for? Like, why are you here? What are you at church for this morning? Did you come with any expectation at all? Did you come looking for something? Did you come because you had to come? Did you come looking for somebody? You see, in life, we're all looking for something. We're all searching for whether it be uh, answers to the big questions in life, like why am I here, what is my purpose, what's the meaning of life, or maybe just finding purpose in relationships, purposes, meanings, hope, direction, all of those things, we're, we're searching for something, and we're looking for these answers, and um, there's a lot of opportunities in the world to find answers. But can I tell you this morning, just because you find an answer doesn't mean it's right. All right, there are a lot of answers out there. There's a lot of things in the world that say, hey, I have the answer to what you're looking for. And you go and you get involved in that thing and you realize that's not the answer at all. It only brings more questions, only brings more problems, more difficulties, more challenges. This morning I want to look at 
a person in the Bible who was looking, who was looking for answers to something. And the amazing thing is, is we see just very little about, or we learn very little about what this person was looking for. But we see an amazing thing of what God gives to him. You know, I think looking for, finding meaning, purpose can really be summed up in a word, vision, right? Where we're looking for vision in our life. We're looking for a vision from God uh, for our lives. We're looking for a vision from God for our churches, for our marriages, all these different things like a vision, some, some sort of thing in the, in the future that you can see coming. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 29, 18, it says that where there is no vision, the people perish. The Amplified says it this way, where there is no vision, no revelation of God and his word, the people are unrestrained. I love this perish unrestrained because really what it means is there, there's no containing people. They just go in every direction. We're scattered about. We're basically like running around like a chicken with our head cut off, just running all around, getting nowhere. Do you ever feel like in life that you've been running and running and running and running and running, but you haven't got anywhere? Do you ever feel like, man, I am tired for having moved no distance at all? Right? I mean, that's why I hate treadmills. They make no sense to me at all. Right? I mean, you run and you run and you run and you're still right there. Right? You're running and that person next to you is, maybe you don't want to be around that person and they're running next to you and you run and you run and they're still right there. Or what's worse is you're running and running and running and they're on slow and they just kind of look at you like you're a fool. Right? We're, we're going somewhere, but are we getting anywhere? Are we restrained? Are we living life or are we perishing? Do we have no vision in our life? Well, I want to share with you this morning, as I said, a, a person, an amazing story in the Bible. It's one of, it's really one I, lo I really love, and it's almost an overlooked little section of Scripture because it's just part of a, an amazing book in the Bible, and it's just a part of a chapter. Um, and really, it's one of those things that kind of gets lumped into a whole group. So if you have a Bible, I want you to open to John chapter 1, the Gospel of John chapter 1. And the reason I say that it's kind of clumped together is because we see, before the passages we're going to read, we see Jesus calling the disciples. I was uh, reading an article, um, actually it was kind of a, a, a sermon or a thought by a, a pastor who looked at this section of scripture and said that it's amazing to see Jesus doing random things. And he was like, he just randomly chose people. It's like, hmm, I don't think there's any randomness to this. I think this is precise and specific. But I want to specifically look at one person that Jesus called. And I want to look at kind of his, his calling and see what we might get out of it. So it's in John chapter 1. I want to start in verse 43. It says, the next day he decided to leave for Galilee. Jesus found Philip and told him, follow me. Now, Philip was from Bethsaida, the hometown of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law. And so did the prophets. Jesus, the son of Joseph, Joseph from Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Nathanael asked him. Come and see, Philip answered. Then Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said about him, here is a true Israelite, no deceit in him. How do you know me, Nathanael asked. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you, Jesus answered. Rabbi, Nathanael replied, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. But Jesus responded to him, do you believe only because I told you I saw you under the fig tree? You will see greater things than this. Then he said, I assure you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I love this because I, 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 I love the whole process that Jesus went to. I love the response of the people that Jesus went to, right? We, we start here in the verses that we read and what do we see, right? We see that Jesus found Philip and told him, follow me. 
And he did. <laughs> and he did. It's an amazing thing. Right? We could tell people all the time, hey, do this, and they don't. Right? And we could say, hey, follow me, and they're like, no way. I love this because we see a few things. Jesus had been on this, this mission to find his disciples, and he had stopped and he had found people, and he'd be like, hey, follow me. Hey, follow me. I'm going to make you fishers of men. I'm going to teach you what it is to follow after God. And they just come and they would follow. One of the things I love about this is we see Jesus find Philip randomly. No. It's not random at all. In fact, a lot of uh, scripture shows or a lot of study and history shows that, that there's a good chance that some of these people knew each other, right? They're from the same place. They might have even been friends. They might have been enemies. But they knew each other and it says that Jesus found Philip and said, hey, follow me. And then here's an interesting thing. What does Philip do? Philip immediately goes and finds Nathaniel. Here's a little sidebar for you for a moment. Jesus found someone, and they go and find someone else. What a concept, right? What an amazing idea this might be, that if we were found, that we might go find someone else. That when we find Jesus, that we might go and take someone else and help them find Jesus. If only Jesus had told us to do something like that. Imagine the possibilities of if the church would go into all of the world and like share the good news and make disciples. Man, that's how, that would be a good, that'd be a good ending to a book, wouldn't it? That's exactly what Jesus told us to do. So I love that little sidebar for you, just a little extra in there, no, no charge for that part. He finds Philip. Philip goes and says to Nathaniel, hey, listen, we found him. We found the one. We have found the one that Moses wrote about. We have found the one that the prophets talked about. We have found the one that you've been looking for. Right? Because why would Philip have gone to Nathaniel and told him those things if that isn't what Nathaniel was looking for? So here's Nathaniel sitting under a fig tree, pondering the meaning of life, seeking something, trying to find something and saying, hey man, you know the thing that Moses wrote about, that the prophets talked about? Man, it would be great to find him, wouldn't it? Wouldn't it be amazing to, to connect with the Savior? Wouldn't it be amazing to connect with the Messiah that's been prophesied, that's been talked about for thousands of years? Wouldn't it be awesome to meet him? And along comes Philip and says, hey dude, we found him. We found the one you've been looking for. Really found the one that we've been looking for because if Philip knew what Nathaniel was looking for, I guarantee they've been having some conversations about it. We found the one who fulfills all the prophecies of the Old Testament. The one who Moses and the prophets wrote about. So again, I ask you this morning, what are you looking for? What is it in life that you are looking for? I can tell you that the answer is Jesus. The answer is Jesus. I don't care what it is. If it's financial stability, the right partner in life, the, uh, the best job, the, uh, the best friends, I can tell you Jesus is the answer to that. He is the answer to those questions. He is the one who has the answers to all questions. But even more than that, Philip, or Nathaniel is a little skeptical, says, oh, well, Nazareth, what good can come from that? Right? I guarantee you right now that there are people you're going to go to in life and you're going to go to them and you're going to like say, hey, God has changed my life and they're only going to see you from where you're from. They're going to see you from where you've come from, what you've been, what you've done, your past, and they're always going to sit there and think, man, there's nothing good can come from that person's life. Right? There are times in life where we feel like failures. There are times in life when people call us failures. And say, ah, oh, nothing good can come from that. But one of the things I love is that Nathaniel goes anyway. Because what does Philip say? Just come and see. Just come and see. Use your eyes. Come and look. Use the, come and see the vision, right? Use your vision to see something. He 
didn't sit there and say, oh, well, man, I'm going to answer all of your questions. Let's, let's get into it. What are your questions about people from Nazareth? Well, you know, I don't like, oh, well, here's, the, here's what Jesus, no. He said, just come and see. Just come and see Jesus and see that he doesn't change life. Because Philip knew what was going to happen. He knew his life was going to be changed. Because you can't encounter Christ and not have your life changed. You can come to Christ and not believe. But your life's going to be changed because you're always going to know. You're going to know the truth. Sometimes that's what uh, uh, we're called to do in evangelism. Sometimes we're called to go and evangelize. We're going to tell and share the good news. And those people reject the good news. That's not on us. right? We're going and we're doing what's else because they need to know. Because they have no excuses. So he goes. And when Jesus saw him coming, he said this about him. Here is a true Israelite. No deceit is in him. And and Nathaniel's question is, do you know me? Right? Have you ever had that awkward moment in life? Where someone comes up to you and they start talking to you about you and you have no idea who they are? Right? And you want to ask the question, how do you know me? Right? Right? You're like, who are you? Or here's the worst question to get. Remember me? I don't have such a good memory. Uh, no, I don't remember you. You know, I got to ask that question at my wedding. <laughs> Not by Becky. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I, I knew who she was. Uh, I was good. Uh, no, we're in the receiving line and someone comes up to me and says, do you remember me? And I'm like, I have no idea who you are. I'm like, nope. Like, oh, I'm your, I don't know, cousin, aunt, something or other. I don't know if it's the same, like, I mean, from Maine, so it could be, but, um, (laughs) but anyway, uh, she's like, oh, I haven't seen you since you were this big. I'm like, how am I going to remember you? (laughs) Come on. And I haven't seen you in like 18 years. And how am I supposed to remember you? I was, but anyway, so Jesus, not only says, hey, you random person. He says, hey, I know something about you. I know you. I know you. Right? How do you know me? And this is what Jesus' response to him is. Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. To me, this is an amazing thing because of a couple reasons. One is if we've ever been, if you've ever been, if I've ever been someplace we shouldn't have been, Jesus saw us, but he can still call us. He said, I saw you when you were under the fig tree, and I'm going to call you anyway. I heard you say, can anything good come from Nazareth? But I'm going to call you anyway. Right, so that's good news just for those people here this morning who have been places that they shouldn't have been, doing things they shouldn't have been doing. That's good news is even when you were in those places, God saw you. But he still wants to call you to something more. He said, just because you were there doesn't mean you got to stay there. Just because I saw you there doesn't mean that's where I want you to be. I have something more for you. Right? He said, I saw you. And here's another amazing thing about it is God even sees the little things. Right? The times that we think that God isn't even there. Right? All these times where we go and we say, okay, God's in the big moments. Well, no, God's in the little ones too. When we're sitting there and we have that question or, or, or we're looking for answers or, or maybe we need just a little bit of help or just a little bit of encouragement. And all of a sudden that person shows up and just, you know, puts their arm around us or we get that text message encouraging us or something. And all of a sudden you're like, man, that's awesome. And I didn't expect that. God said, well, I saw you when you were there. I saw you sitting under your doubt tree. I saw you in your fig tree. I saw you even when you were over there. Hey, I saw you when you were sitting in church. He sees it all. He's seen it all. And he still has a call for us in our life. That's one of the things I just love that part where it's like, no, I saw you there. I saw you under the fig tree. Before Philip even called you, before Philip even showed up. You know what? Here's the truth of the matter. Before we were even formed, God knew us. Jeremiah 1.5 says, before he formed us in our mother's womb, he knew us. And here's the thing that baffles me about this, or here's the thing that's kind of, you know, Jesus said, hey, I saw you before Philip called you into the fig tree. I saw you. And what was Nathaniel's response? Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Like he was pumped. Like that was just like, (laughs) minds exploding just because Jesus says, I knew you. 
I want to tell you something this morning. There's far greater things than just God knowing you. Right? We, sometimes we settle for that. Man, if God would just see me. Right? Sometimes we do things just so we think God will see us. Right? I'm going to go to church this morning just so God will see me. Right? I'm going to go out and evangelize just so God will see me. God saw you when you were sitting in your room saying, I'm going to go evangelize just so you'd see me. God says, I saw you then. I see you in everything. But there's more to it than that. Right? There's something greater than that. Right? Sometimes we, we settle just to be seen. In other words, sometimes we just settle for like the, the very minimum. Well, there's so much more. Because look at what Jesus' response to him was. When he was like, I mean, here's, the, I mean, Nathaniel just got converted, right? I mean, he just, he's just like, Rabbi, you are the son of God, right? You are the king of Israel. This amazing, like, pouring out of testimony and of worship of him. And Jesus is like, you're impressed by that? Right? You're impressed because I saw you? Oh, Nathaniel, get ready, man. Because something amazing is coming from that. Because look at Jesus' response. Do you believe only because I said I saw you under the fig tree? You'll see greater things than this. Right? I mean, it's really, it's like, man, if that excites you, just wait. Right? If you're like, hey, man, if God would just know me, and that's what you're seeking, that to you is like the pinnacle, I want you to know that God sees you. He knows you. But there is far greater things than that. And if you're impressed by God knowing who you are, no matter where you've come from, then just wait. God has so much more for you than that. So much more for you than that. And this really is a great example and a great way to show us that, you know, some people think, oh man, you know, getting saved, that's the finish line. Dude, that's a start line. Right? That's the start of this walk with God. I mean, that's amazing. Every, I want everybody to know the Lord. I want everybody to come to Jesus. But here's the thing. Once you come to Jesus, it's not over. It's not like, hey, come on, dude, we're going to go meet Jesus, right? And they come and they get saved and you're just like, yeah, dude, you're done. <laughs> that's the start, right? That's just the very beginning of what this thing is. Jesus says to him, man, no, I have greater things I want to show you than that. Far greater things than that. Far greater things what Jesus was saying is, Nathaniel, I have a vision for your life that's greater than just knowing you. You've been sitting under that fig tree and you were looking for answers, looking for a reason, looking for a vision. Well, I have a vision for you. And it's a greater vision than you coming here and knowing me and me knowing you. He said, I have a vision for your life. I want to show you things. Right? That's what he was saying to the disciples. I want to show you things. I want you to see things you've never seen before. Right? He says, I want to do things in your life that you would have never done in your own. And that's one of the ways that we know that it's from God is when we can't do it on our own, but we need God to accomplish it. Right? Because so many of us settle for the things that we can do. Well, I can achieve this, therefore that must be the goal. And God's like, no, far greater things than that. You want to reach here? He said, I want to reach up here. But Lord, I can't reach up there to get on my shoulders. It's that difference between what we can do and what needs to be done that God fills in the gap. That's where the miracles happen. You understand that, right? God does those things. Like, that's when God starts to work. He says, oh, you come to the end of yourself? Yes, good. Now I can start working. Right? Really, we get in the way sometimes when we're trying to do more and more and more and we're trying to push ourselves to go further and further and further. And God's like, have you given up? I, I, I can get you further than that. I, I have so much more I want to show you. You want to see the top of this hill? I want to show you the top of the mountain. Right? You, you want to climb a mountain? You want to get to top of Mount Batty? I want to take you up on Kilimanjaro. That's amazing. Okay, then let's go to Everest. All right, that's cool. Let's go further than that. Because that's what God wants to do. That's what he was saying to him. He says, I have a vision for you that's far greater than that. You see, there was a burden. There was a burden on Nathaniel. There was a burden on Philip. There was a burden for something greater in life. Right? Vision always starts with a burden. We're burdened for something. We want to see something. We need something. We need answers for it. That's where our vision starts. And God says, well, okay, you have a burden? Good. I can give you a vision to meet that burden. You see, because God has a, a vision for your life. He has a vision for this church. You know, I just want to share with you, like, I have a vision. I see these empty chairs. And my burden is not that I want to see more of these chairs full. My burden is I want to see all of these chairs full. 
Right? And that's where the vision starts. God said, you have a burden? You have a burden to fill up those chairs? Yes. But not just that, Lord. Not just have the chairs be full, but the people in the chairs to be full. Right? Because that's what the vision is. The vision far greater than full seats. It's full people. It's far greater than people coming to church. It's people being the church. You see, because vision is greater than what we can do. I have things. I know I can do things. I could fill up every one of these chairs, but not with people who are full for Christ, who want to know more about God. I could do all kinds of things and get people in here. I mean, of course, I'd probably get fired, right? <laughs> because some of those things, right? I mean, I'm serious, right? There are things you could say, hey, we're doing this at the church. People would come. But they wouldn't be here for the right reasons. No, the burden is greater than that. The burden is, okay, I want to fill up these chairs. Oh, okay. God's like, cool, that's your, that's your burden, that's your vision? Yes. God said, I'm going to show you far greater things than that. He said, I want to fill up these chairs for multiple services. He said, you know what, Mike, there's chairs in other churches. I want to fill them up too. There are empty hearts in this area, and I want them filled too. That's what the vision is. The vision is greater than that. The vision requires us. Coming to Jesus and saying, you know, Lord, this is what I want to see in Jesus. Like, man, I want to show you more. I want to show you greater things than these. Right? You're excited. He said, you know, you're excited when it's half full. No, I want to see what it's like when it's full. You think it's amazing when you go out and, and, and someone uh, talks to you about a prayer challenge? No, no, no. I want you to know how amazing it is when those people's prayers are answered. He said, that's what I want you to know. He said, that's what I want to show you. Far greater things than these. Right? Jesus told us. Right? In John 14, verse 12, he said, I assure you, assure you that one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and he will do even greater works than these. Greater works, greater things. You understand that God has greater things he wants to show you. Greater things he wants to do in your life. You could be saying, God, man, God, if you could, if you could just get me to tolerate my spouse. God's like, no. I have far greater things I want to show you. I want to show you what it's like to be in a relationship and in a marriage where you honor me in everything that you do. And I want you to see what it's like to love them unconditionally like I love you. I want you to see what it's like to give of yourself, to sacrifice for your wife like I've sacrificed for you. He said, that's what I want you to see. I want you to see something greater than that. I want to see things that are full Lives that are full, right? Because what does Jesus say? I have come that they might have life and life abundantly, right? In John 10, 10, life abundantly also means life that is full. Jesus, I want you to have a full life. I want you to see things greater than that. Full lives, full seats, full lives. And how do we do that? Well, it's, it, it, it's, it's, it's this thing. Right? It, it, it's, it's reach, teach, repeat, right? I, I just want you to know that I, I got this from a shampoo bottle. I'm serious. If, you, if you're not reading shampoo bottles for great theology, then you're missing out, okay? Because think about this, right? Reach, teach, repeat. Reach people through evangelism, through ministry, right? Reach people for Jesus. Teach them through discipleship, through fellowship, through worship, right? Reach them, teach them, and then repeat. Send them out to do the same things. Right? Just like we saw Philip do. Right? Reach Philip, teach Philip, send Philip out to repeat it. Reach, teach, repeat. That is a vision. Right? That's a vision statement. God wants to do far greater things. Right? He wants us to reach people who are far from him. Right? He wants, to teach, he wants us to teach them all the things that he's taught us. So they can repeat it. So they can go and to do it. Right? Paul tells Timothy, hey, listen, Timothy, this is what I want you to do. Here is your ministry. Here's how you do ministry. Timothy, I'm going to teach you things, and then I want you to entrust those teachings into competent people, trustworthy people who will do the very same things. Right? That's discipleship. God wants us to do that. He says, I want to show you far greater things than this. I want you to know that there's more to life than surviving. You, you can actually thrive in life. And it doesn't require circumstances to change. It requires hearts to change. Your heart to change. Right, I love that saying that says, uh, you know, pain is inevitable, but misery, be, misery is optional. Right, we don't have to be miserable in our circumstances. God says, I want you to thrive. I want to show you far greater things than these. 
You're stuck down here in the mire and in the clay. I want to put you up to the pinnacle. I want to pull you out of that. I want to show you something greater than that. There's more than just life. There's abundant life, right? There's more than sitting in church. There's people, you know, there's, there's a, hey, here's a crazy thought. Being the church. Instead of being at church, be the church, right? Be the church wherever you are. Is that something greater? Do you understand, right? Going to church, being the church, far greater things than these. There's more than just being seen by God, but there's being used by God. Man, I, it's great. God knows me. I love that. I, I'm so thankful that he knows me, that he loves me, that, he, that when he was dying on the cross, he was thinking of how much he loved me, right? And how much he loved you. But there's, you know, there's greater than that. There's greater things than that, being used of God, to be that repeat cycle of it, to know that someone taught me and I can now teach others. What an amazing legacy it is to have been taught and then to use that teaching to go on. Right? There are mentors in my life. There are, there are, are men of God who have invested in my life. And now I'm in the place where I have been reached. I have been taught and now I get to repeat those things. And I get to see those things and greater things because what God is doing in my life. That's what he wants us to do. Far greater things than that. Right? Because look what he says. He says, I want to show you, you will see far greater things than these in verse 50. But look at verse 51. He says, I assure you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I love that phrase, heaven's opened. Because we see it in Scripture and other places. And any time in Scripture we see about the heavens being opened, whether it be the windows or the gates of heaven being opened, it means that we are given a revelation of God. We see a new aspect of Him or a new way of dealing with God. When the heavens open, man is given a vision of God and heaven. And we see what God has prepared for us. God says, I want to open up the heavens. I don't want there to be anything between you and me. Right? He says, he says listen, Nathaniel, I, I, I'm going to show you far greater things than these. Because I'm going to open up the heavens. So there's a direct connect between you and me. I want to show you these and I want you to have that direct connection with me because I want you to see what I can do. I want to be able to pour out blessings on your life, Nathaniel. He said, and I need the heavens open so I can just pour them out. Yeah, I'm not going to send a little piece of mail. He said, I'm just going to pour them right out. I'm going to open up the windows and I'm just going to start pouring it out on you. He says, I want you to see those greater things than that. When the heavens open, man is given this vision that God's, of the things that God has prepared for him, right? Open heavens give us an unhindered access to God's presence, to his blessings. I have greater things to show you, he said to Nathaniel. I want to open up the heavens for you because I have a call in your life, Nathaniel. I have a call in your life and a vision for your life that can't be accomplished by yourself, that you need me to open up my heavens to, to be able to accomplish it. Right? When was the last time you had a vision in your life that was so great, so, so big, so high up, that you would need God to open up the heavens for it to come to pass? Because that's the type of vision that God has for our life. He said, I want to I prosper you in life. He said, you, you want, you want the, I want to do this in your life. He said, I want to open up the heavens and be able to pour these things down upon you. He said, Nathaniel, I have a call in your life. You need to stop sitting under the fig tree because I have other places for you to go. It's time to stop sitting under the fig tree and start living the meaning of your life. Right? A lot of times we sit there and think, what's the meaning of life? Jesus, I'll show you. Follow me. I will put meaning in your life and then I will show you the meaning of your life. Because the meaning of your life is far greater than you think it is. It's not to just exist. It's not to just, hey, you know what? Someday I'm going to, you know, get my degree. I'm going to get married. I'm going to live in a yellow house with a white picket fence and have two and a half kids and a dog. Awesome. But here's the thing. But what if those two and a half kids and your spouse don't know Jesus? What if that dog doesn't know Jesus? Right, long, I'm telling you right now, a long time ago, I made fun of, like, I'm not made fun of, but I made light of it. My pastor, Pastor Revito, I was teaching Sunday school, and a kid in my Sunday school said, you know, pray for my pet. And I was like, 
well, you know, like, why don't we just pray for something else, you know? And they're like, no, pray for my pet, you know, because, you know, my pet's sick and I want my pet to, to go to heaven. And I was really young in my, teach, my understanding then, and I was like, oh, you know, they don't have a soul, and how does this work? And so I went to Pastor Vito, and I was like, Pastor, um, this kid asked me to pray for their, their pet during Sunday school. And he's like, you prayed, didn't you? Well, not really, because, see, you know, theologically, he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, kid asked you to pray for their pet, you pray for their pet. Right? He said, you're not God. I'm like, well, that's a good point. Right? He's like, no, you pray, right? And he says, you pray, because that might be the very thing that they need to hear that's going to open up their hearts to Jesus. He said, you start praying for your pets. I'm like, okay, Pastor, I will pray for pets. And from then on, I pray for pets, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm not stopping, right? Because there's a vision, there's something greater than that. Right? Getting to know the Lord, that's what I want. You know, we spend a lot of time napping under fig trees, looking for meaning, searching for meaning in life. And Jesus says, I'm right here. I have a meaning for your life and I want to show you that meaning. You know what? The nap time is over. It's time to move. It's time to step into the vision that God has for us. It's time to stop sitting in church and start time to be the church. Right? The, the time for sitting is over. We've got to stand up. We've got to rise up. Right? The enemy has taken too much ground. Do you understand? Too much ground has been taken by the enemy and Christians continue to retreat. And God's like, it's time for a muster call. He said, it's time for you, Christian, to stand up and to be who I've called you to be. Stop sitting on your fig tree churches and time to get out there and start winning the lost. Right? It's time to rise up. It's time to stop sitting and stand. It's time to start being Christ followers. Right? Because that's what he said. He said to him, follow me. Right? Follow me, Jesus said. Hey, you over there, fishermen, follow me. Hey, Philip, follow me. Philip's like, hey, Nathaniel, come see. Come see he did. And Jesus is like, follow me. Right? Followers of Christ. Action. Right? God is calling on believers to come and to, to, to muster up. Right? Because I said the enemy's taken too much ground. It's time for us to win back that ground. It's time for men of God to be men of God. Right? We just, we just laid to rest a man of God. Right? Billy Graham was a man of God. There is no doubt. Right? I mean, people from the, the millions of people came to know Jesus through his teaching because he was a man of God. Why? Because he simply did what God called him to do. He could have been an amazing pastor of a small church or of a big church. But God, that wasn't God's vision. God said, no, Billy, I have something greater for you than that. I want you to go into all the world and I'm going to put you in stadiums and you're going to preach to thousands upon thousands upon millions of people. And they're going to come to know me because you're going to go and do what I've called you to do. If you'll just stand up and to do it. Where are the men of God now? Who's this generation? Who's going to stand up and be the man that God's called you to be? Who's going to be the woman that God's called you to be? Right? We need men of God. We need women of God. We need young people of God who are not afraid to stand up for what they believe in. Who to say, no, I am a child of God. I'm not afraid of you. I'm not afraid of what you can say or what you can do. Because I know the Lord and he's going to show me far greater things than this. Far greater things in your grade that you're going to give me in school. Far greater things than that. He said, I'm going to show you what it is to be a follower of Christ. You think that we are all filled with hate? No, we're filled with love. Because God loved me. And he loved the world and he sent his son to die for you and to, for me. For all the things that we've done wrong. And I want to tell people about that. I want to stop being afraid. I want to rise up. I want to take back our families. I want to take back our schools. I want to take back our churches. I want to take back our nation. And it starts with people of God getting out from under the fig tree and going and seeing what it is to stand under an open heaven and a God who loves us and has called us to do far greater things than even he did and actually say, you know what? I'm going to actually try and do greater things than you did, Jesus, because you said I can do it and I'm going to follow you and we're going to do it. Amen. The time for searching for answers is over because the answer has been found and it's in Jesus. 
The Bible tells us, seek and you will find. I want you to find Jesus. He's right here. He says, I want to have a relationship with you. I want to show you far greater things. He said, I'm calling you to greater things. He said, I'm calling you to greater things. 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 Will you go? Or are you going to sit under the fig tree? Are you going to sit and ponder the meaning of life? Or are you going to start living a life of meaning? It's up to you. The world needs you. The church needs you. And God has a plan for you. It's time to rise up and be who God's called you to be. Let's pray. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. I thank you that while we were lost in sin, you were providing a way. Jesus, I thank you that you came and you put on flesh. And you lived this life. And you walked amongst us. And you were tempted like we're tempted. But you resisted through the word and through the truth. And that while we were still sinners, you died for us, Jesus. And you didn't just die for us in a, a symbolic way, but in an actual way. That it wasn't easy, but you gave your life. That you were hanging on that cross when God the Father turned his back on you and poured out all of the wrath for not your mistakes, but our mistakes, for our sins. And Jesus, you died for us. And the only thing you could think about was how much you loved us. We were on your mind and in your heart. And you were put in that tomb. On that third day, you rose again. That tomb was empty so that we could be full. That tomb was empty because you had a mission and a plan for us. And you told it to the disciples and you told them to go into all of the world and to bring the good news and to make disciples and to teach them all of the things that you've taught us. And Lord, that mission is not accomplished yet because we're still here. We still have that mission. You are calling us to go and to do, to reach, to teach, and to repeat because that is your vision for us and for this church. Lord, I pray the Grace Bible Fellowship would be a church that does that. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, he is reaching out to you this morning. And all he wants from you is for you to take that free gift of salvation. He says, I have far greater things I want to show you in life. He said, but it starts with you knowing that I love you and that I died for you. And that you can't save yourself, but I saved you. And if you're here this morning and you've never taken that free gift of salvation, now is the time. And I want you to just pray something like this. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and dying for me. Thank you for taking my place. Right here, right now, in this seat, Lord, I open up my heart to you to, be, to come in and to be my Savior. And if you're saying that prayer this morning, would you just raise your hand? I just want to be able to thank God for it. Is there anyone this morning? If you've already made that commitment in your life, then I want to challenge you to not only a prayer challenge, but I want to challenge you to live a life of meaning. I want to challenge you to, to, to be in love with God, to, to pray to God, and to be who he's called you to be. To stop living in fear and start living in faith. The faith that can move a mountain. The faith that can uproot a plant and plant it in the water. The kind of faith that's only as big as a mustard seed, but can change the world. God, I thank you and I praise you. I praise you for each and every person here. I thank you for the calls that you have in our life. And Lord, I ask that we would follow through on those calls. Lord, I ask that we would come to you so when you open up the heavens for us, Lord, and you pour out your blessings, that we'd be right there to soak them all in. 
Father God, I thank you and I praise you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.